This week's a little different for us on Distant Shores. Cheryl and I just got back from the Toronto International Boat Show 2018, and we'd had a number of requests for our seminars that we gave there, so we recorded that, and uh, let us know in the comments below if this is helpful. Please give a very warm welcome to Paul and Cheryl Shaw. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for coming, and it's nice to know how many people are thinking of some sort of ocean crossing in the future too. And nice to see familiar faces from uh, cruising and also from previous boat shows. We always look forward to chatting with everybody. So to start with, we'll just go through a quick background of the boats that we've used to cross oceans with. We'll go through these kind of quick. This is our first uh, home-built boat. We built this uh, from a bare hull and deck. It's, she's 37 feet long. Uh, we spent three years building it, and if you're anyone taking notes, write down, do not build own boat and sail across oceans. <laughs> um, then we rather more sensibly bought a boat. This was a Southerly 42, and we took her across the Atlantic once and uh, did about 16,000 miles with her, and first boat with a lifting keel that we ever had. And then this was our second Southerly, which is a Southerly 49. We did three Atlantic crossings with her and something like, I don't remember, 30,000, 40,000 miles. Um, our next boat is just getting ready to go to the Dusseldorf Boat Show, which is in Germany and starts on the weekend. Uh, the boat will be on the truck today going down there to be in the show. So, so watch our YouTube channel. We're going to be doing a tour of the boat and lots from the Dusseldorf show. In terms of crossing the Atlantic, when we're talking about ocean crossing, we've done uh, many crossings of the Atlantic. All our sea miles are in the Atlantic. and. That was our first crossing in 1980, or 1990, I should say, via Bermuda, and then the Azores before going on to Portugal. Um, those crossings were 10 days to Bermuda, 18 days to the Azores, and another 10 on to uh, Portugal. Uh, the way back from that trip, this is all with our little 37-footer. We headed into the Med a little way, and then back down to Brazil via Madeira and the Canary Islands before going back to the Caribbean. Uh, we did another uh, crossing a few years later again in the same boat, so we did four Atlantic crossings with just two of us on board. It's quite a lot more work if you're thinking of doing crossings with two people. It's, well, there we go. Um, more of a party if you have more people on board than just uh, two, that's for sure. It's a lot of hard work if it's just two people on the boat. Did you guys always do it with just your two? Yeah. Yeah. Then we continued to cross. We did another crossing uh, on the on our 42 when we got it, and in 2015 we did a loop around the Atlantic. This is kind of a fun trip. You can do that all in one year. You're trying to avoid the hurricane season in the Caribbean. You head up to the Bermuda and the Azores for the summer, enjoy that, and then head back in the fall after hurricane season is over and cross over before Christmas. So you can do kind of a one-year loop of the Atlantic. We did that with the 49, crossing to the Azores with just Cheryl and I, and then crossing back with uh, Doug and a friend Anthony, so there was four of us on the return journey. So that's all with the 49-footer. We also did a crossing just a couple weeks ago. We crossed over with the catamarans, our first Atlantic crossing or big passage with the cat. So here's a quick little overview of that. This is a brand new Blue Water 50 made by Discovery Yachts, uh, 50 foot long, obviously, and quite luxurious boat, must say. Back in September in England, Discovery's new Blue Water 50 catamaran made her debut. Shortly after the boat show, a delivery crew sailed her from England to the Canary Islands at Las Palmas. We and four other photojournalists had agreed to sail her onwards, the nearly 3,000 miles across the Atlantic to the Caribbean. It will be our first major passage on a catamaran and a great chance to experience a crossing on this luxurious vessel. So the only real problem we had with that crossing wasn't with the boat, it was just the fact that we didn't really get as much wind as we'd always had on previous times. So we, we'd always tell you there's lots of wind on that trade wind crossing, and we just didn't get the trades. They just didn't, kept not coming. So. 
Yes, it was an extremely comfortable crossing, uh, but uh, we didn't get the challenges to really learn how it is to sail a catamaran. But a very beautiful boat, and how many people here are considering a catamaran or own a catamaran? So we've got a few, yes. Okay, it is a great way to travel, I have to say. If you want to take a look at that, we just put up three YouTube episodes on that, so we have a lot of, do a lot on YouTube these days, so check it out if you're interested in seeing what that crossing is like. So catamarans can be really great, especially that downwind crossing, um, it's very good for the cats, and lots of them do it, and do a good quick passage too. Um, if you're looking at monohulls, we've done them in monohulls, I think 35 feet and up is, is more comfortable, and 40 feet is, is definitely getting into a, a more the waterline length will help to make a much more comfortable crossing, as well as give you a bit more room to have people come on to help. Because as we say, we've done lots of crossings with just the two of us. It's a lot more work. If you've got people on board, so long as they're good friends and you get along great, uh, like we did with these guys, then we have a really great time. And it's really a lot of fun. Of course, if you have people you don't like or you picked up on the dock or uh, who knows what's going on, it could be now you're stuck on the boat with them and you can't get off. And, that, and it's a small space. It's a small a space. Boat for a long time at sea. Um, is there anybody interested in doing powerboat voyaging? They, they're definitely doable. We've done a bit on powerboats. Um, I think I've got, yeah, we'll talk about this a little bit further on. And also, obviously, ocean passaging is a lot harder, more challenging for boats. So if you're thinking of getting one, um, possibly an older boat is an upgrade it to make it ready to do oceans is another option. Um, it doesn't have to be a new boat, of course. Uh, the cats, we've sailed on one of these, but not crossing an ocean. This is a Lagoon 380. Uh, lots of lagoons have done uh, ocean crossings. Very competent boat. We had a week on one in the Virgins, and it was a great, great boat. And these guys actually won the ARC 2015, the year that we sailed. Yeah, they did, they did great. They're yeah. very quick, even though it's only 38 feet. Comfy boat. Uh, this was what we did it on the last time. Uh, one of the rare, one of those days it was just so calm. It looks like Lake Ontario in the summer, doesn't it? So. The middle of the Atlantic's not supposed to look like that. That's a Blue Water 50, the one we were on, and we got, even got the drone up, nearly lost it, but there you go. So I wanted to do another little piece. This is just showing a bit of the sea state. So this is the seas I expected we would get, because we normally have a few days of sort of perkier weather. This catamaran came, so I think a Lagoon 50, and it came up quite close to us. So I said, come really, really close, please, close as you can, and we'll shoot you in the waves. So we videoed them, and this is a piece. It gives you an idea what the seas can be like, not the whole way across, but at least for some of it, you'd expect the waves to be like this. The seas today are three or four meters high, and the squalls are gusting over 30, closer to 40 knots. It's always hard to photograph waves, and having Poco Loco come close like this is a great opportunity to see what a sailboat looks like in ocean conditions. They also snap some photos so we can see what Distant Shores 2 looks like. For the next few days, we swap places. We overtake them as they reef down at night, and they get back in front during the daytime. Nice to have company in the middle of the ocean. The size of those waves. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to show the size of waves, and that was able to really, because there was a boat there and you know how big it is, it was able to, really nice to be able to see it. So I think, you guys, did you have waves like that? Some point on the crossing, usually. Yeah, yeah, so it, it does happen, but you don't spend all your time in that. You have to be ready for, for other conditions, calmer conditions too. Yeah, and th that uh, video was shot uh, less than a week out of the St. Lucia and the Caribbean. And you do tend to get more squally weather on that part of the passage if you're coming from the Canary Islands to the Caribbean. Um, in terms of boats that are suitable to do the crossing, this was uh, pretty similar to our uh, first boat, Go Small, Go Now, Lynn and Larry Party say that, and um, our first boat was 37, I think this is a 34 as I remember, I don't know the model, I think it's a rival, but I'm not sure, uh, British built boat, and they're, uh, you know, it was quite competent, lots of people have gone around the world in boats like that, but they're pretty small inside. That's our, our most current boat, the Distant Shores 2, and it, you know, that sort of length, near 50 feet, She's got a longer water line equals smoother motion, for sure. 
And that's one of the big differences, because you're out in the same waves everyone else is, but the water line's 13 feet longer than our first boat. That means the ride is much smoother. And uh, also, you've longer water line means faster passages. So we did this passage, I think, was 16 days across the same that we just did in 21. And then when we did the crossing from the Cape Verde with Doug on board, uh, that was a kind of ridiculous 11 days uh, from the Cape Verde, so very fast. Really good, good crew on Good crew really <laughs> zooming along. So, And then the other thing is with a slightly bigger boat, like by the time you get up over 40, there's room to have crew on board and just to have that as an option. So in terms of the daily routine, this is a little bit of a, little bit of a passage here with some lighter winds and we're trying to catch all of the wind we can get. So we've set up our jib on downwind poles and gives again a bit of a feeling of the daily routine on, out on the ocean. It's over 2,000 nautical miles to St. Lucia and could take us two weeks or more. The first two days we have the perfect winds for distant shores too, with 20 to 25 knots from astern. To get the most speed we've rigged our sails so we can fly all three of our main sails at once. We have our mainsail on port side and our large Genoa set opposite on the starboard or right hand side. We're using our downwind pole to hold the sail out as it would collapse otherwise hitting downwind like this. Then to get even more push from the wind, we've also set our smaller jib out on port side as well to catch the last bit of the wind that escapes between the two sails. The result is we're roaring along at nearly nine knots, hull speed, and even surfing down waves averaging nearly 200 miles in one 24-hour period. We hit 12 to 15 knots regularly while surfing. Although the waves are from 6 to 10 feet, the motion isn't too bad since we're going downwind. Down below decks, we're lucky Cheryl doesn't often succumb to seasickness and is happily cooking up a storm, making us fresh bread and some pretty fancy dinners. Yeah, we ate very well on that passage. And then this last passage we did, it was even crazier because we had three good cooks on board. It was more like the pastry and gourmet crews. Yeah, it was the first passage we'd all done that we didn't lose weight, we actually gained weight because it was so calm and Alexander was baking cakes and we were making amazing meals and it, it was really fun. Um, in terms of power boats that can do ocean crossings, it's a little tougher with a power boat because you've got to carry all the fuel to do it, but boats like this, the Diesel Duck, this is friends of ours, and we made one episode on sailing that boat around in the Caribbean, actually two, one in the San Blas Islands and one in the U.S. Virgins. Um, so boats like that can definitely cross oceans. Uh, this is the Diesel Duck, and then another one like that is the Nordhaven 40, 46. Yeah. So those kind of boats you see crossing oceans as well. So uh, boats like that can do it. Um, in terms of older boats and sort of doing an upgrade, this is a friends of ours bought, um, I think it's a 35, kind of a former race boat. They did lots of upgrades. You've got to not spare money on the rigging. And if it's an older boat, it needs a new, perhaps the whole rig needs to be replaced or perhaps an engine, you know, but you've, you've got to make sure it's really up to date. Rigging and sails definitely the engine and perhaps electrical system would need some upgrades as well. So it's not just about buying the boat, you've got to leave some budget to make sure that you've, you've got it really ship shape if you're going to be out on your own. And if you find something that's a real deal, um, it's very helpful if you're handy because it can be quite expensive to have somebody else do all those upgrades. And with an older boat, you know, they're going to be constantly projects that you'll want to be fixing and updating as you cruise. So um, just keep that in mind if you're shopping for a used boat. Just looking at the kind of boats, this was, has everyone, anyone heard of the Atlantic Rally for Cruisers, the ARC? I know you guys have. Um, quite a few have. Okay, so it, the Atlantic Rally is a group that get together in the Canary Islands and head across the Atlantic. This is Las Palmas. Uh, just before heading off on that one, that edition of it, and we were there just a few weeks ago. And uh, in terms of stats of the typical boats, I thought it was interesting to look through who is in the rally. Like something like 250 boats started it this year. The average length of the boats was 50 feet. The biggest was 90. The smallest was 32 that year. I think it was similar this year. 
The oldest was 76 years old. That's not the person, that's the boat. So <laughs> that's quite an old boat. There were 28 new boats, uh, but I think a lot of people who are just, they think, oh, they could join the, they buy a new boat, join the rally. You know, it's kind of nice to get a little bit of some of the courses and seminars that they do at the beginning of the rally before you get into it. Uh, the average boat was a mono hull. There was more multi hulls than there had been before, but it's still a small percentage, something like 10% of cat were catamarans uh, that year. And the average crew size was five. So again, when you're doing the Atlantic, it's a crowded boat, but you've got a lot of people to spell off if somebody gets seasick or someone gets, you know, you can think of an injury, but it could be as small as just cutting yourself with a knife in the galley. And then that person might not want to be able to do watches and everything. So. If it's just two people and you lose one person, you're basically single-handing. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody gets seasick. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be able to have a third or fourth person. And yeah, and it just makes it more of a holiday. You've, you're there with your friends. Then if you're up, there's probably other people up too to keep you company. And it's definitely fun to be in the rallies because you're all connected by radio or email. Uh, and the seminars that they do ahead of time are really great. And they do safety checks of your boat, which is reassuring. So, you know, lots of pros and cons because uh, usually there's a start date and you have to leave at that date. And it's not maybe the date you would choose if you were on your own. So um, we've done it both ways. We've done the arc twice. And this last crossing we did with the catamaran, um, we weren't participating in the arc, but we were an arc press boat. So we left between the start of the arc plus, which stops in the Cap Verde Islands, and then goes on to the Caribbean. And the arc left behind us going straight to St. Lucia from the Caribbean. So. And they all had a really slow crossing this year. Um, also, some of the yachts that are doing the Atlantic crossings will be looking for crew. So if you're looking for experience, it's a possibility uh, to join yachts either as a, you know, paying to go in a cabin or a berth or just coming along with a friend from a yacht club to help them out on a crossing if they're looking for crew. So we meet some people who do that. In, in case of one of our British friends, his wife didn't want to come. She wanted to stay with the kids and then they would fly over and do a cruise around the Caribbean after that. But meanwhile, he could cross over with his yacht club friends and the four of them could have a guy's cruise across the Atlantic, uh, you know, pushing hard and racing and eating beans out of a tin, that kind of cruise rather than <laughs> that not everyone else would have liked. Like so. cakes. Yeah. <laughs> and on the, the um, Art Plus that we did in 2015 with Doug and Anthony on board, Paul and I had done a lot of ocean miles that year and I just wasn't up to doing watches. So the three guys just wanted to race and have fun. So they did the watches and I did all the galley stuff because I really enjoy being in the galley and I don't get seasick. So I was the on-call person and I would get up and make sure everybody was fine each watch. But if there was a squall, not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> so there are different ways you can do watch. And you can do as much as you can to get the perfect boat. I don't know if you can have it all. Maybe he's just landing the helicopter there just to make sure they're all okay. You can have it all, but it may not be worth it. It may not be as much fun. Um, in terms of getting out and having power for the crossing, power generation is always an issue. Uh, even if you're sailing a lot, day sail, putting a lot of miles on, you might not realize just how much it uses to run the boat 24 hours a day. Where are we going to get the power from? So recently, uh, we, with uh, Distant Chores 2, we added the solar panel arch, a big project we did with Doug. And uh, that gave ton of power. So now when the boat was sitting in a marina or sitting, sorry, in an anchorage, is basically self-sufficient on the solar. Uh, but for ocean crossing, it still needed extra power, but that stopped the need to recharge the battery as much as we would have. Um, towed generators, we've not had experience with that. You can sort of have those little, looks like a little outboard motor that hangs on the back and generates power. What is it called? The Watton Sea is the popular one nowadays, isn't it? Yeah. It looks like a little outboard stuck on the back of the boat and you can flip it up. If a shark eats it, you can pull it up and put a new blade on it and back down. People will be self sufficient with that one. Yeah, the tow, that would do all the power you needed. Um, having a generator, we've always had a generator on the boat to get the extra power. And some people just rely on the main engine, but again, that's, that's a little trickier because the main engine, if that goes down, then you've kind of lost everything. You don't have enough. Normally, if you have a generator or solar, then you've got that. If the main engine goes down, at least you can put something in to the batteries. 
uh, for different sail options, again downwind. We've not used a spinnaker before until this last year, so this is our spinnaker that we flew for frankly weeks, like over a week and a half, day I think we, night. day and night we were flying the spinnaker in the super light air. So this is putting the spinnaker up and dealing with it. It was good fun and uh, beautiful to sail along. I think the great thing about a spinnaker is you, at least you can sail on those light days when it's just so beautiful out and to be ghosting along instead of listening to the engine. It's, it's you know, it's a lot, that's why we're sailing, it's to really sail and, and that really was just spectacular. We quite enjoyed it. So how much speed are we hoping for? We don't have hardly any wind Not today. much wind here today. We're well it's barely under 10 rippling. knots, huh? What's the true wind, Sherry? is 5.2, 5.5. We've got eight knots true from a stern. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's so. our speed over ground now? Or? Speed over ground. Five knots. Last time we set the spinnaker with the sheets one onto each hull for going dead downwind. But this time we're going to try setting it on the bowsprit and heading a bit further upwind. Perhaps it'll get us more speed. We've rerun the sheets to the aft winches here so Dave can adjust both walking back and forth across the stern. All right, you ready? ready? All right, let's go. Let's launch her. It's on the seat. Yeah. Looking good there. On auto. It's just really light, huh? Very light. Very Next light. Start by playing with that. Yeah, that looks better. Nice. Really is a concern not just to deal with storms. I think a lot of the times before we first went off sailing all those years ago, we we're always worried about what would happen in the storm. But in fact, there's a lot of light air too, so you do have to worry about that. You spend a lot more time in light air than you spend in storms. So uh, you need to think about that as well for making sure the boat can handle it. And this, the catamaran had an asymmetric sim, uh, spinnaker, so we could sail it as a geniker and also a, a full-out spinnaker. So we didn't have a lot of experience with that, and it was really great to get it with the cat, and we're certainly thinking about it for our new boat. So. We've usually sailed with using two jibs, so this is a setup with both, we have two jibs and we've always had that on our boats, and then put one to each side, one out uh, either on the end of the, uh, the boom, and then the other one out on the pole. So that's sort of the rig. With this kind of rig, it's not just like throw a pole out for now, we're going to set it up and the boat is permanently rigged that way. So we can put the sail out and then if we want to, if a squall comes up and one person's alone on watch, they can just put the sail away. Leave the pole out, it'll just sit there, won't move because it's rigged with a fore guy, an after guy and a topping lift. Essentially the pole is held out like a derrick, it'll just hang out there and then you're pulling the sail out, putting it on, putting it away again when if the wind is too strong. So. It gives you a way to project a lot more um, sail area for going straight downwind, and that has always mm -hmm. uh, enabled us to do much faster crossings than people who can't run those sails. And it's a very good setup uh, for shorthanded sailing. So if Paul and I are sailing offshore, just the two of us, I'll be on watch by myself when he's resting. And if I need to reef that head sail, it's very easy. I'll just furl it in and I don't have to deal with a pole. I can just leave it out there. It's all secured and then uh, furl it out again if I need to. So, you know, it's very easy for one person to handle. That's also a carbon pole, so it's pretty light. You're only holding the one end of it, but it's very light. I could take that pole and hold it up one, with one hand. So this is setting it up. We have been at sea and out of sight of land for more than a week crossing the Atlantic Ocean and still have 800 miles to go to St. Lucia. This whole passage has been entirely downwind and we've been using our carbon fiber downwind pole. When we need to jive to the other side, it means shifting the pole, rigging and sails across to set everything up again. We rig the downwind pole with a line for a topping lift to hold the outboard end of the pole up and two more lines run to the end of the pole to hold it fore and aft. We also run a line to hold the sail itself called the sheet. Normally this line runs to the Genoa track on deck, but when we have the sail out on the pole, it's better to run it back to a block further aft, then up to the winch. We've had the sail set the same way, the same tack, the same side for nearly seven days. Finally time to 
long drive across and 800 miles to go to St. Lucia. Now that's the life out in the ocean. You could leave a sail set for five days or seven days all in the same. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> Something exciting is happening back there. Yeah, so that's uh, with the downwind pole. Um, in terms of reefing, you obviously need to practice reefing and have perhaps a third reef added if you don't have a, a deep reef. We've never, we've carried storm sails on the boat. We've like almost never used storm sails. Um, I don't know if that was your experience, but we usually found we just reef down, uh, reefing, putting a third reef in or furl the furler up. Yeah, do you have a storm tri sail? Do you carry it? Never used it, yeah. That was our experience. We carried a storm trisail around for years and sold the boat with it and never bought another one. And we've had lots of rough weather, but always we would double or triple reef. And then uh, talking about crew a little bit, I think we've talked about that a little bit already, but the advantage of having crew means easier watches. The, disadvantage, the biggest disadvantage of crew is usually, well, obviously you have to carry more food. Um, the other big disadvantage is that if you've got people who are trying to book, uh, they're trying to book a flight home. They've, they've come out, and, but they've already planned their visit home and they, it's hard for some people to get their mind that they might need to wait, so. But it's great. Uh, we found four to five, maybe six people is, is really nice. Um, we've done crossings with three, that was great too. Um, and with the two of us, we like that, but it is a lot more work. Um, that was our crew in 2012, that was very nice. Uh, doing that crossing, that was 16 days. Yeah, and just that one extra person means you all get more sleep and you have a good time. And actually, for some uh, insurance, that is a requirement, especially for your first crossing on your own boat. Most insurance companies require that there is one, three people minimum, and one person that has ocean experience. So um, that's why a lot of people like to join a friend or sign up to buy a berth on a, a, the Ark or some other ocean rally. Then they get that experience and take their own boat the next time. This is our fifth transatlantic crossing, but only the second time we have had extra crew. Our friend Matt joins us to help with the watches. Spend a lot of our time off watch down here in the aft cabins. These are the most comfortable cabins at sea. We're doing watches 24 hours, so We've divided that up. Matt and I are doing nine hours each in three shifts, and Cheryl's doing six hours because she's cooking. Rolling downwind, you have to sort of jam yourself into the corner because the motion just keeps the boat rolling. And it is a bit of a trouble sometimes to fall asleep in daylight like this, but you still have to keep on the watch schedule. Pretty comfortable down here, it's warm enough and it's just gonna get warmer as we go south. In terms of having watches and standing watches, we've done different setups for watch keeping. Um, obviously, someone has to be on watch all the time, at least we always do it that way. We always have somebody up on deck or at least checking every few minutes to make sure they're looking around the horizon and everything. So in terms of keeping a watch, we've done different watch schedules, but the last few we've done it divided into three. So you'd have three hours on, six hours off. And either that's one of us doing it or on the last crossing with six of us, we had two of us at a time, three hours on, six off. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean you sleep the whole time. You can come up and be on deck, but you're not the one on watch. Something, some, you know that someone is always looking around because that's the guy who's de delegated, it's his watch, it's right. 12 o'clock, he's on watch. So. Yeah. And on average, it takes about 15, 20 minutes for a ship to come over the horizon. So Paul and I set timers for 10 minutes and we make sure that every 10 minutes we physically stand up and look around the whole horizon. That way, if you know, at, as the ship is just about to come over the horizon, if we miss it, then we'll catch it halfway towards us. Now, of course, with AIS and radar, you have other tools for that. But that's just something we've always done. And it's amazing how you don't see things, because maybe a ship will be down in the trough of a wave or another sailboat. And so just physically getting up, being present, doing a scan 365 degrees, then scanning from your boat out to the horizon. Sometimes you'll look at the horizon and not see there's a little fishing boat 
halfway out. So uh, that was something that you know we really tried to encourage all our crew to do. But it's getting harder now. Everyone likes to be on their phones and watching uh, <laughs> watching the videos or not the video screen, the chart plotter. Yeah, and the AIS. Yeah, yeah. What about that chip over there? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah. So sorry. We radar. Don't, yep. I don't use the radar much for finding ships. I think it's not a, not as reliable. I mean, AIS, of course, gives you the name of the ship, right. and it's at a greater distance. But once the waves get a little bigger, you're getting sea clutter, and it depends on the radars, but you probably won't see target more than four or five miles away anyway, uh, especially as the seas get up a little bit. When the seas are really flat, you'll see a, you can see a ship a long way away. But mm -hmm. uh, Radar, we use it much more for tracking weather at sea, Offshore, see where storms are. You can see the rain in storms 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think for approaching islands where there's going to be sailboats that perhaps haven't got, have got such a weak light you can't see them. Or, uh, you know, we use them for boats close in. I'll quickly go through some of the safety gear. Um, we're big fans on wearing life jackets. Uh, we do always wear a life jacket. Um, I think if you make YouTube videos and you don't wear a life jacket, people probably say, don't wear, why don't you wear a life jacket? So then I put up the video with the catamaran and I got someone complaint said, why do you guys always wear a life jacket? I said, okay, it's very difficult with YouTube sometimes so <laughs> to please everybody. So. Uh, we carry a life raft and uh, I've, made, I've shot a little piece of inflating the life raft, which I still haven't got around to editing, but it was quite interesting to inflate the life raft and then, because we had to get rid of it, get a new one, and it expired, so we gave it a good pull and it inflated and we jumped in and played with it and it was interesting to see. You definitely want to keep your main boat afloat, having been in one of these little life rafts. It's not, the, not what you want to be in, so keep the main boat from sinking. Um, AIS is one of the good ways, I think, of doing that, to make sure you're never going to hit anything. There's just no reason anymore to hit stuff because ships, you can always see them. Uh, if, if you don't have an AIS unit, if you're going to go cruising, definitely get one, but don't skimp and get the AIS that just receives. Why not get a transmitting AIS? It, they don't, number one, if you're worried about privacy, you can turn that off and not transmit. If you're thinking that some pirates are going to see you and come and steal your boat or something, just put it into silent mode. You better explain that margarita glass. <laughs> Why is there a margarita glass in the middle? of? Yeah, we put little waypoints of uh, where we're going to get to. So yes, Normally, they're destination waypoints. Yeah. With the Ray Marine chart plotter, you can have all these little icons, so we always put that before we make landfall. Um, this is a big safety feature that I'm just super keen on. It's super, super cheap. Uh, most people don't have this. Basically, you've got a bilge pump, an electric float bilge pump. That's the typical bilge pump that's on most boats. I think most people are familiar with that. I really believe you should have an alarm on it. I want to know if the bilge pump is pumping water. I don't want it to pump water quietly and then not let me know that there's a problem. And then I'm going to suddenly realize, you've read this in stories, a guy gets, wakes up in his bunk, puts his foot out of the bunk, and it's knee deep in water, is in his bilge. So, so why does that ever happen? You can always know uh, just by uh, having a little, basically it's a $2 uh, Radio Shack beeper that will beep if the bilge pump goes off. And you can have a switch to turn it off so it doesn't, if it's going and you're dealing with a problem, you don't have to listen to the alarm. But definitely, you want to know if there's water in the bilge. It's, it's probably the most common cause of boats sinking, is that they get enough water in them. The boat, water has come in from something stupid, like a hose clamp is broken. And you don't know about it until there's gallons of water in the bilge. And now you look, and there's water sloshing around everywhere. And you can't find where the leak is, because there's water sloshing around everywhere. So the first water that comes in, if you get a beep, and you go down, and you look, and you everything's dry because it's just started a problem. You can find the problem and it's probably just a hose clamp. Um, in terms of cross, uh, doing sort of an Atlantic cruise, that's sort of the, the key islands that are out there for you to use if you're planning on crossing or doing the Atlantic. Um, Bermuda is very convenient and the Azores are very conveniently located. And of course people want to go to the Caribbean, so uh, one way to get there is to sort of go around the Atlantic as we were talking about. And then if you're talking about making passages, Usually, and this is a typical summer pattern when a lot of people are crossing over toward Europe, you've got the Azores high goes into place there. So because of the way the winds rotate, you generally go north of that to cross over to the, to the east and go back south of it to cross back to the west. So, and we did a crossing in 2015 from the Caribbean across to the Azores, but if you go directly there, you're probably just going to go into flat calms. 
So you're going to have to go north, get near Bermuda, and then head across. And uh, just to show you, some, again, some of the calmer weather, here's a little bit from uh, crossing over. And a little bit of floating debris. You rarely get that in the ocean, but we, we, in this case, we saw it a few hundred yards away and went over to just investigate what was floating, because you can see how flat it was. That's the middle of the Atlantic. But it's so flat that we could see that a long way away, so we went over to see what it was. <laughs> That's a very good question. What is it, Paul? It's some kind of a piece of a ship from the look of it. It's made out of steel, quite heavy. But it's floating, because I guess it's a tank of some sort. At least it's got fit. It looks like it has fittings, so it'll keep floating like this. If we banged into this at the night, it would have woken us up, that's for sure. One of the bigger problems, rather than hitting things, I think, a bigger problem that more people have uh, crossing the ocean is going to be chafe, especially on these long passages. Because if you've gone out and had experience sailing, like setting up the exact rig we're talking about, having the, the jibs or whatever on the end of the pole, you've probably done that for a, a couple hours and you come back. And then you say, well, we know how to do that. But it turns out that if you ran it for five days on end, you, things are going to chafe. Because more things... There's a lot more wear on it over five days than two hours. It's suddenly it's equivalent of years of work, or years of work on the line moving back and forth. So that's just a bit of a line that was nearly chafed through. We pulled it down and we're trying to figure out where the chafe was coming from and on the end of the pole fitting and try to reduce and deal with protecting the boat from chafe. Another common problem was having issues with the forestay or the rig, as there's a lot of stress on that, and a lot of stress on the steering system. So we saw a couple of rudders on the dock. People had problems generating power during the crossing, and there were problems with engines and battery systems, and uh, some more rig issues here with the uh, jibing, which happened to us on the way across. And sails often were in trouble at the end of the crossing. We had uh, no engine issues, but the number of people had that, and if they were relying on the engine, that was another problem. And in this case, when these guys came in, they had problems with practically everything. A week after we got in, boats are still arriving. They have been out there for such a long time. Congratulations! After 25 days at sea, and despite a lot of difficulties, the crew of Girls for Sail makes it in before the finish line closes. So what was your biggest challenge or the moment that everybody really started to get discouraged? The day I suppose, one? No, I mean, you know, the, the mainsail broke on the first day and then of course we had awful horrific weather and that was quite a big bonding moment I suppose because we didn't really know each other that well but that was a time when you really kind of had to stick together and look after each other which was great and then of course then the engine went then that meant that eventually so no power to anything um, and I think we were doing okay weren't we we were you know thinking eventually everything will come back together we had a nice little patch then we had another moment where we met another French boat after the event and they said it was apocalyptic and that's kind of how it had been. And then we hit the doldrums. So it was then I think everybody started to have a really low point because we'd been out by then about 18, 19 days and you just think, oh, please, someone, anyone, come and get us. But <laughs> carry on going. Yeah, so that was cool. Well done, congratulations. Thank you. It's an amazing achievement. We have insurance for distant shores, and we have always used, for the last 18 years, we've used the Pantaneous Company. Uh, you need insurance that really is there when you have a problem, not just a piece of paper, and they've been wonderful. We've also got a satellite communications, which we have on the boat. We've, this was our first sat phone. It worked fine as a phone, but not so well for connecting to the internet. Uh, but this, we've really enjoyed this product the last few years, the Iridium Go, basically a hotspot turning your phone to allow it to make calls, as well as allowing you to get weather information. So this is one of the predict wind charts that we uh, downloaded on our last crossing. Uh, in the past, we've used our single sideband radio for weather and communications, but we don't use that very much anymore. 
Uh, what's next for you? Are you guys going to get out there and cross some oceans? We hope uh, we've been able to help uh, in some way with that. Um, for us, the next project is going around the world on Distant Shores 3, the new boat. We'll be heading out into the South Pacific. For more information, check out our website at distantshores.ca and follow our YouTube channel, Distant Shores 1 on YouTube. And this was one of our most fun seasons, season 9, when we did the Atlantic Rally crossing the Atlantic the same year. We also crossed France during the Small Canal. So if you haven't seen that DVD, uh, why not take a look and pick it up? Thank you all for coming, and good luck with your projects getting out on the water. And thanks to everyone of you out there who's tuned in and watched it on YouTube. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up, and uh, don't forget to subscribe for upcoming episodes and follow along as we get the new Distant Shores 3 out on the water. Coming up in the next little while, we're going over to Dusseldorf. Probably be over there right now as you're watching this to see the new boat come out. And we're looking forward to new adventures. And if there's anything we can do to help get you guys out on the water, let us know too. And maybe we'll see you out on the water. So tonight is the last, possibly last or second last night. We have a very, very light winds. I think it's only blowing about seven knots, unfortunately, downwind. Oh, so we're bouncing and banging. But we've had such a great sail, I don't want to put the engine on. We've got about 150 miles to go to the Cabo Verde Islands. So hopefully the wind will pick up a little bit over the night or in the morning. Perfect shape. Cheers. Cheers, everyone.